But this week, Telstra, it is still a reasonably highly priced company. The good thing about Telstra is it's throwing off so much um, operating cash flow that uh, uh, we can score it on a prop cash basis. I'll do a pulled pork on Telstra. Wow, we haven't very... done one of those, I think, since the beginning of QAV. It was one we did in like 2000 and whenever it was, 19. Did we? I didn't think I'd done Telstra. Well, not we weren't doing pulled porks back then, but back then when oh, okay. we started, we were taking a stock each week and breaking it down and looking at its numbers. And TLS was one of the first stocks that uh, we ever really analysed. When I was building my checklist based on trying to understand the gibberish thing oh, you were talking that's about. Right. So, <laughs> that's it's right. like we... episode episode <laughs> three or four, I think, of the first season we did TLS, yeah. I think we were but using I, Telstra as an example of how to find stock doctor data manually, wasn't it? I think that was part of it, yeah, looking at Yahoo yeah. Finance and doing all that kind of mm. stuff. Mm. Yeah. Right. Anyway, so Telstra's back on the buy list. It's at the very bottom of the buy list, so it may not be there for long. So do your own research. Uh, and, and look, I've got to say, I'm, Telstra is one of those companies I'm very ambivalent towards, and I don't mean indifferent. I mean the dictionary definition of ambivalence. I love it and I hate it. And and doing this pulled pork just brought out all those emotions in me again because Telstra's really two businesses and a couple of years ago they actually separated them into separate companies under a holding company, Telstra Group, um, and the market got excited because they thought they were going to spin off the infrastructure business, Telstra Infrastructure. And that's the part I love. I mean, we're, we're sitting here talking on, on Zoom and... We'll put out a podcast on people's phones that they can listen to, and it's all done over the backbone of all the telco infrastructure in Australia that, you know, has been around for a long time. And Telstra pretty much owns and manages much, most of that, if not almost all of it. I mean, Vodafone and Optus will have a bit, but nowhere near as much as Telstra has. Isn't and, it NBN? Isn't it Kevin Rudd's uh, home home network? Yeah, well, NBN's in there now too. I think didn't it get sold back to Telstra a year or two ago? I think. I don't know. I haven't followed it. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure. But uh, NBN aside, the rest, like the uh, undersea cables, some satellites, all the data centers, the switches, um, all that kind of stuff. It's all it's all Telstra, and and that's the side I love. I mean, that that just gets on with doing it. Um, there's very rarely an outage. Occasionally, there's an outage. Um, but we rely on it all the time. To me, that's a good business. Then you got the other side, which is like the retail arm, which whenever I engage in them, they are just the worst retailers ever. Uh, I think I spoke years ago about when I came back to Australia and tried to set up my home phone and my home phone at Cape Shank and just spent days in mm. in call in call centre waiting queues to try and sort out the most basic of situations. And don't don't even I, – I don't even know or try to guess what's the best mobile service plan for me to be on. It's just too, all too complicated. So it's that's the side of Telstra I hate. And interestingly, interestingly enough, and in going through some of their more recent uh, announcements, they, they want to make custom, the customer experience part of their growth plans. And I, I – <laughs> That wouldn't be hard to do because they're coming off a very low base, but they've got to do a lot better than what they... I mean, go to a Telstra store. Last time I went to a Telstra store, mm. there was no one in it, and I got mm. told to take a number and come back in half an hour when mm. <laughs> it would be my turn. And I'm like, mm. there's no one, there's no mm. one here. <laughs> Walk straight into the Optus shop. Yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> yeah, well, we actually have TPG here now because I got so pissed off with using trying to get onto Telstra. So anyway, that's the side I hate. Um I mean, Telstra has a great storied history. It's 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 basically a government business that was floated un under John Howard um, in two tranches. But before that, you know, it goes right back to the early 1900s, 1901, I think, when the telegraph lines and the telegrams were all put under the, the auspices of the Postmaster General. So for a long time, Telstra was called PMG. And then... Around about the time of World War II, Australia started to realise it needed to have reliable communications with the rest of the world and uh, dropped a few undersea cables, and that became, I think, OTC, uh, Overseas Telecommunications Company. And then a bit after that, they were combined 
became Telecom and then floated and became Telstra and then just recently had this kind of internal demerger and it's now Telstra Group. So it's been around for a long time, um, long, long history. Like I said, one one side, the infrastructure side, um, is a is a good business and it's growing too because the use of data just keeps keeps on growing as things become more and more digit, digitized. Um, I did have a laugh when they were talking about um, uh, increasing their satellite business. And I, I thought about the fact that I couldn't get that at Cape Shank, which was the only place I needed it. So I got um, Elon Musk satellite instead. So they've they still got a long way to go with their customer service. Mm. Um, what else can I say about them? Australia's largest telco, obviously. Uh, latest Investor Day update called out customer experience, 5G and satellite as their growth areas. And I, I just put a question mark against those three things because I don't think they do any of those things well. So, uh, well, I, I, I shouldn't say they don't do 5G well. It's it's a growing part of their business. But I remember all the hype on around 5G when it came out. And we I think we had it in Canada slightly ahead of Australia. And... and I had a SIM card that could convert from three or four G to five G, and I'm like, "There's no difference," and I still, I still can't name any benefit from five G, you know, that we that we get compared to what we used to have. Really, um, it's it's either all happened seamlessly, or um, or it's all been a lot of hype. But um, but yeah, so not sure about five G. Your um, download infra-code. speeds on five G are massively higher than four G. If you're if you've got a good signal, like I get two hundred megabits a second download on five G, which I never would have got on four G. But don't know if you ever try and download or upload anything that big from your phone to care about. No, it's not like you're, you're not streaming video on your phone. I mean, no. things like if you're taking a FaceTime call or something like that when you're on a mm-hmm. walk and you're away from your Wi-Fi in the house, that's where 5G comes into play really. But if you're not doing that, if you're just mm. reading the ABC or the Fin Review mm. on your phone, yeah, you don't really need the 5G. It's probably I don't read them on my phone. I read them on my laptop. <laughs> yeah, so if you're not yeah. using your phone for high yeah. bandwidth applications, it, but I think for you know people with jobs uh, <laughs> who are out and about, you know, doing stuff on their iPads and okay. their iPhones and running corporate apps, CRM apps, ERP apps, Salesforce, all that kind of stuff, you know, a lot of data probably is a good thing. Okay. I'm just here, well, like I hate Telstra with a passion, and I'll tell you why <laughs> at the end of this. But I get as five G is good. I'm not gonna, I'm okay. not gonna let you shit talk five G on my watch. Well, it's, I'm, I'm not shit. I'm not shit talking it. I just, I just thought it was tremendous hype that I haven't seen much benefit from. But I defer to your experience. Uh, okay, that'll be, so <laughs> that'll be the only time that ever happens. <laughs> yeah. What else can I say? So the, the, some of the things which I found interesting, which which were also in their Investor Day briefing, um, they are calling out uh, growth areas being data centres, which makes sense, um, growth in fibre, which might be NBM related, I'm not sure, and security. So uh, they, I think they probably are legitimate growth, you know, growth centres for them. Um, probably... Going back to your 5G comments, the mobile business is seeing 30% growth in data usage. So um, that's year on year, which is which is quite tremendous for them. Anyway, I think there's no point going into Telstra in any more detail. Most people have used them or not used them or loved them or been pissed off by them over the years. And it's yeah, you know, the funny thing is it's not just Telstra. When I was in Canada, Rogers was the big telco player and everyone just hated, loved to hate Rogers. I had a friend whose husband got a job working for Rogers and she just said, before you say anything, it's just a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. just had to keep defending herself. Um, anyway, look at the numbers and this is where it gets um, interesting because it's a very large company. I, I think it would be a difficult company to run. It's it's quite possible that splitting it and, and floating off infrastructure, Telstra, um, Infraco would be a good thing. Um, I think those 
But Telstra never came out and said they were doing that, and they're certainly not saying it now, but it might happen in the future and things are being set up so it can happen. But just the span of all everything they do must be, you know, hell on earth for a CEO to try and mm. manage all the, the fires and the risks and all those different areas. Um, and maybe a bit of focus would come if they, it was split up. But anyway... Um, we don't have to worry about ADT because it's uh, over. It's nearly seventy-one million dollars a day, so it's a very highly traded stock on the ASX. I'm doing the analysis of the share price of four dollars, which is less than consensus target. The yield Telstra Telstra for a long time has been um, considered to be, as I said once before, a bond proxy. So. Uh, you know, something that has bond-like characteristics. It's a very stable share price. It's probably traded in the 3 to $4 time range for the last five years, um, and it pays a decent yield. But I think these days with interest rates high, um, the yield isn't enough. So the yield at the moment is 4.25%, um, but it needs to have a yield of 6.8% to score on our checklist. Uh, and I, I guess it begs the question, if this is a kind of bond, um, then if you can get those kinds of rates from putting your money in the bank, why do you take any sort of risk on and dealing with on, on you know Telstra stuffing things up and the share price going down? So I think it's, that may lead to them raising their interest rate or their dividend, sorry, yield at some stage. We'll wait and see on that one. Stock Doctor actually rate them as a star income stock, which we give half a point for in our checklist. But I think. You know, if I was a retiree and I can get the same sort of yield with less risk, I don't think I'd be buying Telstra. I'd probably just buy an index fund, which has a similar sort of yield anyway. Um, Stock Doctor Financial Health is strong and steady, so that's all good. Uh, Prop cap for this is just under our cutoff of seven. It's 6.79 times. Um, ROE is okay, even though we don't use it to score with. I'll just call it out for listeners. It's 11.3%, which is... On the low side, I guess, but it is a big company with lots of um, assets. Uh, net equity per share is $1.54. Um, so share price at $4. We can't buy this for anything like the book value. Um, earnings per share growth is 10%, which again isn't bad for a company the size of Telstra, but it doesn't. it's not enough to score for our uh, earnings per share over PE score. Uh, obviously, no owner founder. It's been around for too long, and the current board doesn't have any large shareholders that we can score. Um, PE is is still pretty high. It's 23.95, but it is the lowest in the last six halves, so we do score it for that. Um, so it is a it is still a reasonably highly priced company. The good thing about Telstra is it's throwing off so much um, operating cash flow that uh, uh, we can score it on a prop cash basis. Uh, it's it's a reasonably recent three point trend line upturn, so we score it for that. Just misses scoring for consistently increasing equity. There was one half when um, it dropped backwards slightly, so we can't give it a score for that. But all in all, quality score of ten point five out of sixteen, or sixty six percent, and a QAV score of point one. So anybody who wants a a large cap blue chip. Uh, type of stock, this might be the time to buy it. So, but have a look and do your own research. Mm, thank you, Tony. You know, my I've told you these stories before, but when I was in my Microsoft days, I had a lot to do with Telstra. And uh, this is like Frank Blunt was the CEO, and then Sol Trujillo, and then Ziggy Swakowski. And like, there would it was just like oh, horrible, horrible. The, just the the corporate attitude of the company then. Like I, like I took them, I remember taking all of the senior execs, like the general manager, I think they called them GMs of all the divisions, out to dinner in New Orleans, flew them all over to the US to meet with Bill Gates and all the execs, Frank Blunt and all of the guys, took all the guys out for dinner one night. And this is like, 2000 and no 1998 1998 and they'd they'd been rolling cable out around the country bill gates had made a big deal you know um that they'd been rolling cable out um a couple of years earlier did the joint venture uh with them 
but they weren't making it available. Well, we had all of this cable in the ground, but they wouldn't make it. I mean, it, you could get it, but it was like for a thousand bucks a month if you wanted high bandwidth internet access. And I said to them, why, uh, why, oh, when, now, when are you going to make this stuff available, the high bandwidth access to people? And they said, when we're forced to. I said, what do you mean? They go, well, when we're forced to by the government, then we'll do it. I was like, well, why did you spend billions of dollars rolling out cable if you weren't going to make it available? And they said, it's easy, it's to stop Optus. So if Optus laid cable in the ground, Telstra laid cable in the ground, it was just mm. to stop Optus from getting a foothold. I said, so you're, you're, you're spending billions of dollars of taxpayers' money, because they hadn't been completely, I think they were like 30% or 60% floated at the time. You're spending taxpayers' money to stop Australians from getting access to high bandwidth internet access. And they were like, yep. <laughs> because it's, they were defending their defending their moat, basically. Mm. Instead of working out ways they could sell it for and what margin and what services they could offer. And if you were a privately owned company, fine, do whatever you want with your money. But when they were still mm. partly taxpayer owned, mm. to spend taxpayer money to stop taxpayers from getting access, access to the internet <laughs> just drove me nuts. And this, their whole attitude, it was just like their level of arrogance out of all of the senior execs in these companies about how domineering they were and and they were terrified you know the longer i spent in there i realized they had no idea what would happen to telephony revenues and, and they were right to be terrified as well once people had access to voip voice over ip which is what we we're all talking about back then now we just call it facetime or skype but it was yeah. voice over yeah. ip what that would happen to their revenue stream which was telephone calls primarily yeah. they they knew it was going to white ant their own revenue and they were determined to stop that from happening as long as possible even though doing that meant stop us stop australians from getting access to you know bandwidth and which is one of the reasons why microsoft dumped telstra as a partner and went with packer um for online um services was because telstra were just dragging their feet they they were determined not to give australians access to <laughs> fast internet and fast internet enabled services until they absolutely had to we could have been australia one of the reasons gates was excited in 95 and and did the joint venture was australia could have been the world leader in providing high internet access and services on top of that in the late 90s. But Telstra stopped us from being able to do that because they didn't know what it meant to their voice revenues and also their Foxtel revenues, right? They they had the Foxtel JV around about that time, didn't know what it meant for that. So them and Murdoch just, and you know, prevented it, made the MBN rollout really hard as well. All the politics involved in the early days of the MBN rollout and all of the FUD that was going on about, well, satellites versus cable and, you know, remember Turnbull, you know, and I'll never forgive Turnbull for this, saying, oh, cable, putting glass under the ground, that's going to be outdated in six months. There'll all be satellites, it'll all be like, you know, wireless bullshit. Bull and everyone in the industry knew it was bullshit, but just stopped us again. The second time around, we could have had, you know, NBN 10 years faster than we had it and all of the services that come from that. Just anywho, that's my rant over. Moving right okay. along. Um, so you're not going to be putting Telstra into the dummy portfolio? Oh, I will buy it <laughs> if I have to buy it. Yeah, them and Atlas, bloody, what is it? Apollo. Apollo. Apollo Tourism. Tourism. <laughs> you know, if, the, if they're in the portfolio, I'll buy them. I hate them. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do it with gritted teeth, but I'll do it. 